So as with every test, the reason we're actually doing the test is to find out whether or not we have a disease and to make a medical decision. And as part of the whole concept of medical decision making, we have what's effectively like a, a kind of a post-analytical variable, if you want to call it that. So it's what we're doing after we've got the tests. What do we do with the tests? But sometimes it's really obvious. Um, for example, a pregnancy test is a yes, no. So it's going to tell you if you're pregnant or not, hopefully. And that's going to give you your answer. So then you have a decision of whether you do something on the basis of that. In cases of infection, in cases of tumors, and so on and so on, ultimately all of those tests allow clinicians to make a medical decision. So without the tests, you don't get the decision being made. So this is where, this is the part of the healthcare spectrum that the laboratory really sits in and occupies. And I know everyone has is familiar with the concept of a normal distribution, but I just want to give a brief refresher on exactly what it looks like, because this really is one of the most straightforward ways for you to understand the concepts of sensitivity and specificity in a you know, clear, visual, and unambiguous way. So if you just remember that the idea with the normal distribution is that you take a patient's data, OK, or an individual's data. And we're always working with individuals in this case. And what we do is we count up the number of individuals we have. So I'll just sort of draw bad squares on this to show you what I mean. If we have, if each of these is, you know, one person's measurement, as we add them up, you can start to see that we get a pattern that's broadly similar to this bell curve. And what we're doing is we're looking at how close the value is to the mean, and then we're stacking up groups of values. So let's say the mean might be 5, and then we're going from 5 to 6 here and then 6 to 7, and so on. And ultimately, we're, we're adding those over and over again until we start to build this shape. And where we get the shape from is the distribution of the numbers of individuals from our population who have values equivalent to that particular value, whether it's the mean or slightly above or below the mean. And in this case, we're normalizing everything to the mean. OK, so basically it's a certain times greater than the mean or a certain times lower than the mean. And if we take the mean, which is the highest point, and obviously that makes sense, we should have the most number of individual instances of that sample when we have the mean. Katie, do you have a question? OK. So we should have the most number of individual samples when we have the mean. And the further we go from the mean, either above the mean or below the mean, then the less of those that we have. And that's indicated by the curve dropping. So the further away from the, the mean we are, the lower the curve is. And that corresponds to the lower, we, the, lower the likelihood of those particular samples we have. So if you look at the shaded areas, in the middle we have the mean plus or minus, and plus is going to the right here, and minus is going to the left, plus or minus one standard deviation. 
And in that range, you accommodate roughly 68% of the population. It's not exactly 68, but let's call it 68. It just makes life a lot easier. If we go two standard deviations away, we're going to get 95% of the population. And we discussed already this idea about the p-value of less than 0 0.05 roughly corresponds to a 5% probability. And then the last one, plus or minus three standard deviations, that's pretty much everybody. So 99% of the results from people will be in th within three standard deviations. Now, the reason I'm spending some time on this is to make sure that everybody is happy with the idea that the tails of this, so the dark parts that, that are shaded the darkest here and here, they represent they represent the rare events or the rare measurements. And the closer you get to the center, you get more and more common ones. And ultimately, if we're comparing uh, healthy and diseased, we want to be able to separate the common measurements that everybody has when you're healthy and the common measurements that everybody has when you're sick. So in an ideal world, with a perfect test situation, you would have something like this. Can everybody see that OK? Is it big enough? OK, great. And everybody with me so far, yeah? It's, I know it's none of that is really new for anyone. So this is basically the perfect case scenario where there's no overlap. OK, so there's no overlap between the two populations. And in the absence of an overlap, then you basically have a situation where the test is going to give you an unequivocal answer. So everyone with no disease has a value on the left-hand side, and everyone with a disease is on the right-hand side. So there's no overlap. So if I measure and I get a value that is beyond this cutoff point, so this vertical line, and that basically indicates that I have a disease. If I'm below the line, that means I have no disease. So let's just start to see what happens when we have some overlap. As we begin to move them closer and closer together, you see that we now have a, a region in between the two where some people who don't have the disease will have values that overlap with people who do have the disease. And as we continue to push them closer and closer together, it starts to become very, very obvious that the overlap is causing a major problem for us and that many more people are now showing up in a region that's shared by both populations. And if we keep going to the logical extreme of this, we end up with nonsense. And I've deliberately left the text here in an unreadable way just to highlight that when the distribution overlaps so much, the test is meaningless. We can't do anything with it. There's no advantage to having it. It's not even as good as flipping a coin. Effectively, what this means is that for every patient who has the disease, there's an equivalent person with the same value of the test parameter, or whatever it is, who doesn't have the disease. So long and short of it is there's no difference between diseased and controlled patients in this example. So do we think this is a good test then? If this is a blood test, would it be a good one to discriminate between healthy and diseased? Yep, absolutely. It would be shocking. It would be pointless and it would be a waste. And it would be something that we would avoid like the plague. And even if you were in this sort of situation, you would avoid it like the plague. 
this probably still avoid. Um, this type of situation is getting close to what we would have under for many tests, and it's really sort of the goal of where we should be going. So we take the example like this, and then put our cutoff in the middle. We can define then a few different regions in this, and these are these regions are described by terms that you've probably heard before. So here's the, here are those terms in nice neat text, not my scribbles on the graphics tablet. So the values that are present, and I'm going to attempt to shade this now, and uh, if this goes horribly wrong, I'll just erase all the shading, but uh, my intention is to try and shade. So in this area, and I have no idea why it's going to be yellow, it's supposed to be green. In this area, we have the values that are definitely negative when we measure them by the test. Okay? And are really negative. So they're negative by test and negative by nature, if you want to take it, take that idea. So they're negative on both counts. The status of the patient is negative as well as the test status, if you want to call it that. It's not an ideal way of describing it, but it will do for the purposes of the discussion. And in this little region that I'm going to try and color in pinkish red, we have some people who are positive for the test, or positive for the, the disease, so they have the disease, but they're showing up as negative on the test. So even though they're sick or have a clinical symptoms or clinic not a clinical syndrome, they are not registering as positive by the test. Okay, so they're considered to be false negatives. So they shouldn't be negative, they should be positive. And on the flip side of that, we have a true positive. Okay? So true positives are ones that do have the test, do have a positive test and also have the actual disease or the, syn the syndrome. So they are really, that's sort of positive by name, positive by nature situation. And then the last one, which I don't think I need to bother coloring in, is the false positives. And in the case of a false positive, they are showing up as positive with the test, even though they are negative. Okay. So I know you've heard of all of these terms before, but I just want to make sure that we're all happy with exactly where these are coming from. Now, this is very sensitive to the cutoff value, obviously. So I'm just going to show you um, a little bit more about that. So just bear with me one minute, and we're just going to jump into um, a web browser. And we'll come back to that idea about borderline results, um, Philip. Basically, the borderline results would be considered to be at the edges of the tail. Okay, so they're borderline one. Are you talking about titers or are you talking about yes no results? It depends on exactly how the yes no. Okay, the yes no result is based on a threshold that you've set up. True? So it's your threshold value that's influencing whether something is borderline or not. Coming from a clinical chemist point of view, I never like the yes, no's. I like the actual value because then that gives you the ability to decide yes, no based on a clinical parameter. But again, we're going to come back to that with the predictive, the powers of predictive values. Um, but basically, borderline results, in your case, because it's yes, no, your distribution won't follow the same type of bell-shaped curve. 
because the bell-shaped curve is defined on the basis of having a mean value, and you can't have a mean of yes or no, because that's don't know. It's in the middle. So it's done slightly differently. But we can come back to that. Um, I mean, if there's a couple of people, if there's a couple of people in the class who want to do something specific like that, from the point of view of positivity for a uh, virology test, then we can certainly do a, a little session specifically for you guys. Um, so just to check, everybody, can you see uh, the magnificent ROC web page with the skin tightener stuff at the top of it? Okay, now I think you'll basically have to just allow me to do this, and I don't know if you'll be able to sort of explore it yourself right now. So this is effectively what we have in our... Okay, I won't let me zoom anymore, so uh, hopefully you can see this okay. So you can see we've got the two overlapping curves again. And if I scroll the little line at the bottom, you'll see it flags the two curves, and it's also doing some calculations for me up in the table. So it's actually giving me the proportions of true and false positives and false negatives. But you can see that there's a big overlap. And depending on where I set my value, so if I, if I want to make sure I have everybody who's blue, if I scroll very, very right up to the end, OK, I'm getting very low false positive rates which means I'm not missing anybody. But I'm also getting low true positive rates because I'm capturing all of these people who are... You can't see it, Claire. Okay, right, I'll come back to this in a different way, so just bear with me. OK, so can people see that now? OK, so OK, so that hopefully should be better. And it also lets me zoom in a little bit as well. So here's our overlapping normal curves, OK? And don't worry about the stuff that's in the, the ROC curve bit to the right. We'll come back to that a little bit later. So I'm going to separate my two curves, OK? So that's, this, that's like the situation that I showed you on the slide a minute ago. They're pr pretty well separated, and I can set a, a cutoff value in the middle. By setting the cutoff value in the middle, effectively maximizes the balance between the concepts of specificity and, sens and sensitivity. Whether or not I can actually really see what's there and whether I can distinguish what's, who has the disease from who doesn't have the disease. So the more overlap there is, even with the same cut off, the worse the test is going to be, because I will pick up more and more. And you can see the red curve is moving more and more beyond the threshold. And as it moves beyond the threshold, that's basically creating a worse and worse test for me from it, the ability to discriminate point of view. So ideally, we want them well separated. And we want a cutoff point that maximizes the sensitivity and specificity. Now, it may be the case that in a screening test, I'll happily take in some normal people. So in this case, I've reduced my cutoff to an extent so that everyone who has the disease, i.e. who's in the red curve, gets picked up. But at the same time, maybe half of the normal people get picked up as well. So we have about a false positive rate of in and about 45%. Now, that's obviously not good. If you have an expensive test, you don't want to be testing a lot of people just for the sake of it. But if you had a really expensive treatment, it might make sense to test for people so that you can 
do a second line test and then rule out all of those people you've tested originally. So you're very sensitive, so you can find everybody, but you're not specific. So you find people who test positive, but maybe don't have symptoms or clinical features consistent with that. So we'll come back to that a little bit later, but I'm just going to jump back into the slides for a minute now. This whole concept basically then really boils down to what's called a two by two table. And a two by two table is really just a way of assembling all of the data from your curves into a table where you look at the positive test versus the state, whether the person is diseased or not diseased, and you do the same with the negative test. And what it allows you to do is basically figure out a couple of different characteristics from your initial data. So one thing that you can actually do is work out the sensitivity. Well, actually, let's before we get into that, let's just kind of look a little bit more to our table. Um, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. OK? So you take the disease, the people that you know have the disease, and then you see how many people test positive who have the disease, and how many people test negative who have the disease. You do exactly the same thing with the non-diseased patients, so you see how many people test positive who don't have it. Now, I put the false ones in red and the true ones in green, just via the traffic light system. So in the negative tests, where they are not diseased and have a negative test, obviously that makes complete sense. That should be a real, genuine negative. But if they test positive, and again, think of your overlapping curves when you think of this. If your curves are overlapping, OK, you will test positive, but you don't actually have the condition. So you get a false positive. So we can take this two by two table and start to actually put it together to make those factors of sensitivity and sensitivity that we discussed, or that I mentioned, I suppose, a minute ago. And sensitivity is basically how many of the real, true, genuine positives, OK? How many of the ones that you measure are there as a percentage of all of the true positives, or all of the people who actually have the disease. So I've highlighted or I've shaded it a little bit here. OK? So the idea is that true positives plus false negatives is everyone who's diseased. Because a false negative, by its definition, is someone who is diseased but tests negative. It's not that there's a problem with the test. It's that, well, OK, I say that I'm, I'm not saying that in a very good way. It's not necessarily that the test is being performed incorrectly on that individual or group of individuals. It's just that their values happen to lie in a range that would be considered negative by the test characteristic even though they're still clinically diseased. So this is where you have a disconnect between the clinical situation, where you're looking at markers and biomarkers and surrogate markers, and the actual clinical endpoint or clinical condition. And this is a big issue in the whole study of biomarkers. Now, the flip side of that is specificity, where we're looking for the true negatives, OK? So the ones who are not diseased and who also give us a negative test. But we have a certain proportion who are definitely negative. So they're negative, no disease, negative test. But sometimes we have no disease, but with a positive test. 
I'm sure you've all encountered those in the lab where you have people who flag up as positive for whatever reason, even though they definitely don't have whatever disease you're interested in. So are people happy enough with that, those concepts of sensitivity and specificity? Okay, so easy enough to work out, but you do need to have the gold standard clinical diagnosis in each case to be able to do this. And that's why you're, we're always battering on about gold standards. Because once you've got the gold standard diagnosis, that actually enables you to calculate the sensitivity and specificity of your test. Now we'll come back to the ROC curve idea in a minute because the sensitivity and specificity come into that. Because clearly there's a trade-off here. If you make your if you make the cutoff too low, you're going to get more false positives. Okay? So you want to maximize your true positives, maximize your true negatives, and minimize the false ones. And that kind of goes without saying. And to do that, you need to optimize those two characteristics and one of the ways that's really come to the fore about doing that is the ROC curve as opposed to just, uh, let's say, a more experience-led approach where an investigator might decide based on their clinical experience that there's a certain threshold that they should use. So there is a bit of a tension between these two things. Um, and the arrows are meant to reflect the tension, not necessarily give you a direction of the tension. So from a specificity point of view, what we're trying to do is make sure that when we say you don't have the disease, you really don't. And from a sensitivity point of view, we want to make sure that everyone who has the disease gets picked up, even those people who have very mild disease, even those people who maybe are not uh, clear cut from the point of view the cutoff value. And again, you can see the cutoff value is sitting in the middle here, where there are always some true positives below it, and there's always some true negatives above it. And the tension between the two kind of boils down to this idea that we're trying to separate these two curves as much as possible. And if I move my cutoff value to the left, okay, I'm going to reduce the number of true positives, which means I will effectively be correctly identifying more of the true neg or correctly identifying the true positives, okay, as having it, but at the same stage I'm identifying a lot of the true negatives as having it as well. But there's always a proportion of negatives that I'll identify that definitely don't have it. As I increase my sensitivity, then basically the number with identified disease will increase because I'm using a lower and lower and lower cutoff. So, Philip, let's say if you have a cutoff of 10, okay, and that's, that's, if you're above 10, then you're positive. So if you decide that if you're above 8, you're positive, that eliminates a lot of your um, borderline values. However, it doesn't eliminate them, it moves the borderline slightly lower. If you keep moving it lower and lower and lower, eventually everybody will test positive. So where do you place the cutoff? One of the things that actually can happen, and this is something that would be true for manufacturers' tests, is that often they report really nice false positive rates. Typically, those false positive rates are determined on the basis of a nice healthy population and so on and so on. But in the actual sort of wild population, the false positive rates will likely be higher than the manufacturer suggests because you will have people 
who are not, you know, sort of standard healthy people. You'll have people who are perhaps at different stages in a disease. So they may be a little bit sick, they may be absolutely fine, but it won't be as good as, let's say, a manufacturer or a developer's numbers. And that's one of the reasons why you actually need to work at your own ones. So I mentioned this idea about decreasing the cutoff. So if you decrease the cutoff, you increase the sensitivity, but you decrease the specificity. So again, that's your trade-off. And ultimately, what you're trying to do, particularly in a, in a diagnostic system where you might have two tests, you want to try and modify your sensitivity or your cutoff value to have the least harmful and least costly. And the cost and harm depend on your kind of your the, ra the rationale that you have for working with these. So you may want to decrease, you may want to pick a really cheap screening test first. Okay, so you have a low cutoff, but you use your cheap screening test so you can screen everybody. And it's the people who come back as positive on that that you can actually do more work on with the more specific but more expensive test. You don't do the extremely expensive specific test on everybody when you're screening because that wouldn't be a good use of resources. Um, and it may not even be desirable to do that from a clinical or a diagnostic point of view, even theoretically. So if we put a few numbers on this, if we have 100% sensitivity, then everybody gets identified. So there are no false negatives. If we have 80%, then only four-fifths of those with the disease will be identified, and everybody else is left as undetected. So they have the disease, but from our test point of view, they are disease-free. But from a clinical point of view, they have it. And it's the same concept, the same idea, I suppose, with specificity, in that you're trying to correctly classify the people who have it or who don't have it. So if you're 100% specific, then you pretty much make sure that you don't test positive for anyone without the disease. Okay, so specificity means testing for without. And I have a few examples that I've uh, taken from the paper about this, which actually is quite instructive. So here is an example. The round circles are meant to be healthy people, and the black dots are people with the disease, OK? And the idea with the circles and dots is it's meant to emphasize that the test result and the disease status are not the same thing. We're used to thinking of positive test result means they must have the disease. But it's not as clear cut as that. So the test result and the disease status are different. So if we take our patient population, in the nice square, we apply the test, you see you end up with two different colors. You have the negative green test result, and it's mainly, okay, it is mainly the circles that are healthy who are negative. But you can see right down at the bottom, there are some people who have a positive test result are a negative test result and have the disease, okay? Which is clearly not an ideal situation. By the same token, you can see people up here who are testing positive even though they don't have the disease. So again, not an ideal situation. We don't want that positive test result because that's effectively going to contaminate our overall profile and our overall picture. So we want to avoid that. So here we have a total number of 30 people, okay, who have the disease. We have a total identification of 24 of them. So 
the ones highlighted in pink here, so these guys, oops, sorry, I didn't have the pen selected. Okay, they have the disease and they have a positive test, so they are true positives. On the other hand, these guys are negative and they have the disease. So they are false negatives. Okay? So if we take the total number that have the status of being diseased is 30. The correctly identified ones are 24. That gives us a final sensitivity of 80%. Is everybody happy enough with that concept? Is this sort of dots and pins a useful way of looking at it? Um, Lizzie, basically we have 24, hang on, I'll get a skinnier pen, okay, so what we have is a total of 24, which are um, true positives, okay? We have six which are false negatives. So that's a total of 30 with the disease. So when we're working at the sensitivity, it's true positives of 24 divided by 24 plus the false negatives, which is six. So that's 24 over 30. So they are effectively lowering the sensitivity. If these guys had all tested positive by the test, that would be a total of 30 over 30. So it would be 100% sensitivity. If we take the example where, let's say we make, um, let me just get a color to do this. So if we make I was trying to find an equivalent pink, but if I make all of those guys if I make those three um also be positive tests, so that means I have a total of twenty seven positives, so twenty seven true positives divided by twenty seven true positives plus three false negatives. So it's ninety percent sensitivity overall. Does that help? We'll come back to that in a minute. We're just on sensitivity now. So if we're looking at specificity of the test, then we're trying to identify the ones that are disease free. And this is where the false positives comes in. Okay? So here we have the true negative. Most of them are true negative. Okay, it's it's green for negative and then circles for healthy people. So negative test, no disease. That is what we're looking for. However, we do also have false positives here because a proportion of our results are actually coming up as positive, even though they are well. Okay? <coughs> 
So these guys are all positive tests, even though they're well. So the pink, or salmon pink, this subsection, are testing as if they are positive, but because they're circles, that means they don't have the actual test. And the way we're going to work that out, to get our specificity, it's true negatives. And in this case, we have one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times eight as our true negatives. So that's 56. We have 56 true negatives and 14 false positives. So those false positives reduce the overall specificity. And again, we can take exactly the same approach as we had previously. If we change that a little bit more. So if I try and make a few more um, positives. So that's seven more positives. Just like we saw on the previous slide. We now have a total of 63 as true negatives divided by 63 true negatives plus 7 false positives, and that calculates it to be 90%. So just to recap on those, it's the true positives that we're looking for from the point of view of sensitivity because we're trying to find everyone who really has the disease. In specificity, we're trying to find the people who are disease-free, and that's really when the false positives come into play, because false positive means you're testing yes, your condition is no. And then just to give you an example of when it doesn't work well. So here we have a sensitivity of 100%. OK? Everybody tests positive. Now let's give you a concrete example of this. And I'm using my pregnancy test example because that's, you know, as you know, that's something that has to be unequivocal. And it's something that I think everyone is familiar with, regardless of your discipline. If we wanted to go for 100% sensitivity, with a pregnancy test, that would mean everyone would test either positive or negative. So let's say positive. So it, this, the test is so sensitive, it can detect such minute levels of HCG that everyone who does the test shows up with the little blue line. Now that means obviously you're going to have tons and tons and tons of false positives, which is not good. The one on the right is really our ideal situation. We want to be able to test the negative people is negative, the positive people is positive. And both of them would be at 100%. And you're not going to get that ever, because there's a trade-off. It's not as, as binary, as clear-cut as this. And I've got one last one on sensitivity and specificity. So one of the examples, or one of the reasons for using it is that if we have a high sensitivity, we can rule out people. So if our sensitivity is high and you still test negative, we can be pretty sure that you're definitely negative. If your specificity is high, OK, and you test positive, we can be pretty sure that you should be positive because we're excluding, the, we're aiming to exclude people with high sensitivity. Now, the problem is that these ultimately are calculated on the basis of clinical diagnosis. Um, so because we actually use diagnosis to calculate them, they're effectively useless from a diagnostic point of view because we're relying on the fact of actually having a diagnosis before we can do anything with these. So that's a big limitation, OK? So it's really 
not the best thing to have. So what's much more advantage, or advantageous even, is to use the idea of predictive values. All right? And predictive values are basically when we take a patient's result and we try and figure out whether or not that result is likely to have occurred. Now, it sounds a really bizarre way of looking at it, but we imagine what's the probability of somebody having the disease before we do the test. Okay, so let's say somebody comes into a coronary care unit or a cardiac unit. What's the likelihood, just as in low, medium, or high, this is a question for you guys, is the likelihood of somebody having a heart condition low, medium, or high if they're in a coronary care ward in a hospital? Okay, so you're all in agreement the likelihood is high. So before you even do the test, you have a high probability or a high index of suspicion that they have some sort of disease. Right? Then you go and do a test. And after you do the test, you will have what's called a post-test probability. So it's basically the likelihood that they will have the condition when you take their context into account, as in someone who's in a coronary care ward, and when you take the test result into account. So someone in a coronary care ward with positive markers for cardiac damage, okay? Whether it's CK or whether it's troponins. But with positive markers of cardiac damage, that gives you an even greater likelihood or probability that they will have the disease or the condition. One of the limitations, I suppose, of this concept is that it really only works if you're comparing like with like. So if you are looking at, let's say, the coronary care unit, there's a high likelihood of somebody, as you've all established, of somebody having a heart condition. But if you were looking at, uh, let's say, a renal unit, there would be a lower likelihood of someone having a heart condition. It's not unheard of by any stretch of the imagination, and people on dialysis tend to have a higher likelihood of heart disease. But there would be a lower likelihood in that population, because the population is slightly different. So let's try and drill into this in a little bit more detail then. Oops, sorry, wrong slide. So, often you'll hear these described as PPV, positive predictive value, and NPV, negative predictive value. Technically speaking, it should be the positive, or it should be the predictive value of a positive test. Okay? But because it's so often used as PPV and NPV, I'm just going to leave that aside. So if we go down the left-hand side first with the PPV, ultimately what you're trying to do is establish this idea of what's the likelihood going on this side first, what's the likelihood that an individual patient really has the disease when the test result comes back saying it's positive? as in it's above your cutoff, it's above your threshold, whatever it is. And the way you calculate that is, again, using our 2 by 2 table. And in this case, we take the true positives and the false positives. Okay, so everyone who's testing positive. And we divide, we take that sum and we divide that into the true positives. So effectively what you do is you get, you express the true positives 
as a percentage of all the positives. Okay? And just think about that logically for a second. The false positives are positive but not disease status. All right? So if you express your PPV in this way, and if you calculate it in this way, which is the way it's calculated, you will find that the true positive tests will give you a measure of what the likelihood is that a positive, someone who's positive with the test is positive with the disease. So it maps a test onto a disease, which is exactly what we're trying to do whenever we're doing tests. And the negative predictive value does exactly the opposite. It's the proportion of people who test negatives, who test negative, who do not have the disease. Okay, so they're kind of polar opposites. And if you look at the calculations, okay, you'll see for positive predictive value, it's all positives. For negative predictive value, it's all negatives. So it's true negative divided by all negative for negative. It's true positive divided by all positive for positive predictive value. And you're really trying to figure out the percentage of people testing correctly for their disease status. I suppose is really the most straightforward way you can approach it. So I'm going to try and use some of those PIP diagrams again to highlight this idea. So these are exactly the same ones that you saw earlier. Okay? So now I'll just flash up the previous ones just so you can see the difference. When we're looking at sensitivity, we're looking at, remember, we're looking at the ones that are really diseased. In the case of positive predictive value, we're looking at all of the ones that are positive. So we have 24 who are positive and have disease status. We have 14 who are positive but are, have a status of not diseased. So if you put 24 over the, whatever that is, 38, multiply it by 100, you'll end up with about a 63% positive predictive value which means that for this population, okay, you have a 60% chance of correctly identifying. Someone who has a positive test has a roughly two-thirds chance of genuinely having the disease, which is not great if you think about it. And then the flip side with the negative predictive value is taking the greens. You can see that there's an awful lot of negatives who don't have the disease, which is sort of appropriate. And then we have our false negatives, which is a small number. Okay, and then you see you end up, and that should be an N at the bottom. You end up with a negative predictive value. And of 90%, which is a high negative predictive values, predictive value even. And having a high negative predi predictive value would mean that you can effectively rule out people who test negative. I'm desperately trying to put an N in over that, but it's just point blank refusing to allow me to do it. But that should be NPV, not PPV, okay? So you're effectively saying that if I test you negative, there's a 90% chance that you don't have the disease. And if you think about a screening test or a dipstick or a clinical test, a clinician's office test or a GP test, all of those things make a whole lot of sense because you do actually want to make sure that the people you're sending away out of a GP clinic or office or the people you're saying, no, you don't have the disease, probably don't have the disease. So you want to get that as high as possible. Now, there is a caveat with that, okay? And we sort of discussed this a little bit at the start with the coronary care unit. 
the idea underneath PPV and MPV is fairly straightforward. The probability that the result is consistent with the presence or absence of a disease. However, PPV and NPV will be clearly influenced by the population. So if you think about that clinic again, our coronary care unit, if we get a positive test in that, it's much more likely to indicate that those people have a coronary disease. Whereas if we just take random people from the street, they have a low likelihood of the disease. So the positive test is unlikely to indicate that they have an actual coronary disease, even though they test positive. So it's beyond positivity here. Yes, they're, if the test is fine, the test is working. However, as a general rule, their probability of having the test or having the disease will be low. So just having a positive test doesn't massively change their likelihood of having the disease. And again, this kind of comes from the concept of where these are calculated from. If we have the average Joe situation, where we just go and test people in the street, we are much more likely to have lots and lots of false positives and low numbers of true positives because there's actually a small amount of people walking around out there with serious coronary disease. They're all in the hospitals. So their true positives will be low or false positives will be proportionally high. So our positive predictive value will be terrible. And just to kind of highlight that concept for you, if we have a prevalence of a disease that's very, very low, so less than, well, 0 0.01 of a percent, so one hundredth of a percent, even when we have very, very high sensitivity and specificity, and you can see here this column is 90% both, and the next column is 99% of each. So in this case, even when we have really, really good tests, the predictive value is rubbish because there are so few people with that actual disease out there that we really can't detect them because they're not there to be detected. If we jump up to a prevalence of 5%, okay, which is still fairly rare if you think about it from a clinic point of view, you can see that with a high, with a 90% sense and spec, you still only get a very, very poor positive predictive value. And you really need to have almost perfect sensitivity and specificity, which is typically not easy to come by, to start to home in on anything approaching a useful level, and 83 or 84% would be quite handy to have for playing around with. And then you see the, the last one here, if you've got 50%, with a 90% sensitivity and specificity, you're going to pick up, you're going to correctly identify people, or you're going to identify people most of the time, and you're going to correctly flag people with the disease most of the time. And if you're at 99%, obviously, that gets even better. So putting that in our little pips and dots again, here we have prevalence of 30%. OK, we have, we have 30 black dots in a grid of 100. The sensitivity is the same in each case, but the PPV changes drastically. So if the prevalence is 30%, and this is the same example we saw a minute ago, the PPV is 0 0.63. And look what happens if we drop the prevalence, okay? The positive predictive value is lower than half. The negative predictive value increases because there's more negatives. So that's good. That's a way of, of ruling out people. And this, these, these changes, that I've highlighted at the top, they are independent of sensitivity and specificity, which have not changed. Sensitivity is still 80%, so it's 8 out of the 10 samples. 24 out of 30 is the same as 8 out of 10. Specificity is 72 out of 90. 
which it's still 80%. And I have one last one to finish up on, which is another example. So here we have a very, very good test. And in our population of 4,000, half of them, so we have a prevalence of 50%, okay? We screened 4,000 people. We'll find 99% of them, or 1,980, are true positive. 1,980 are true negative. And then the remainders are false positive and false negative, respectively. Okay, because remember, only half of our 4,000 people are actually sick. In this case, because we have so many sick people, it, the test has a very good positive predictive value, i.e., a positive test result is a strong indication that someone has the condition and should be classified as a disease status positive. Now, if we have a lot less people, so scenario two, um, we have only 200 sick people. Same test, screen the same number of people, or 4,000, but only 200 are sick. And now we find out that because we have less sick people, our positive predictive value goes down. Now, it's not a drastic, drastic drop, but it's definitely a drop. And what it indicates is that we're not as confident, I suppose, that if, if only one in 10 people has the disease, okay, when you test positive, the ability of that test to predict the truth of you having the disease has been diminished compared to if one in two people is coming in the door sick when you do the test. Because you're, you almost have an expectation of somebody being, someone being really sick versus an expectation in, in scenario two of people being healthy. So does anyone have any questions on that? I know it's a little bit of an esoteric concept to get your head around. But it is one of the sort of biostats concepts that does permeate most of laboratory medicine. Well, it's, it's not necessarily what you want the test to tell you, but it's what you want to, it's almost like, think of it like the workflow of the patient or of the individual. Do you want to make sure that you always catch everybody and you'll happily accept catching a lot of people who are, you happily accept registering a lot of people as positive by the test even though they are clinically fine on the basis that having the disease is so serious, it's critical that you identify everyone with the disease. So let's take a newborn baby screening. You want to make sure that when you test people in that scenario, you have to be you're erring on the side of caution, I suppose, is a kind of common sense way to do it. You're trying to make sure that you catch everyone who, you, uh, you're definitely sure you have everyone who has an inherited disease, and you don't mind, I'm not saying you don't mind, but it's not as critically important for you to pick up people as false positives you're willing to take the false positives on the basis that maybe you can do a second line test that has more specificity. 
So if you test it in a scenario two, let's say you screened those people and you found 198 as being positive and 38 as false positive. Okay, then you take those that entire group of positives and then you screen them by the second line test. And the second line test then has let's say even higher specificity. Now these are perfect tests more or less. So that's not a major, major issue. But you'd screen them by the second test so that you're increasing the likelihood. And in that case, because you now have an expectation in a way of having the disease, then you have a higher prevalence in the population that you're studying and you have better positive predictive value to rule people in. I suppose, Philip, what you're really asking um, boils down to this idea of the ROC curve, which I've just thrown up on your screen. And the idea with an ROC curve, and it's this thing on the right hand side, is that you effectively have two things mapped on an ROC curve. You have sensitivity and one minus specificity, if I'm remembering it right. They use slightly different terminology on this um, on this website, but it's the interactivity of the website that's very, very useful. So the idea is for a perfect test, okay, so the y-axis is sensitivity here, and I can't write on this one, but that's sensitivity, and this is one minus specificity. For a perfect test, it should be right there up in the top corner. So I'll show you a really terrible test. So there's extremely highly overlapped populations. And if you look at the, there's a sort of a blue and a red crosshairs, and this is really where I'm, I'm, remember sensitivity is on the y-axis, so the red line is a measure of sensitivity and the blue line is a measure of specificity. So as I move along and change my cutoff, I'm changing sensitivity and specificity. And I'm changing the performance of the test. And the place where I get the best trade-off, which is smack bang in the middle, that's the bit that's closest to the top left hand corner, so it's closest to one on the on the y axis. If I separate the curves, you'll see it starts to push itself towards one. It gets closer and closer to one. And again I can move my cutoff to highlight that. But it's the point that's closest to a sensitivity of one, which is a sensitivity of a hundred percent and specificity, one minus specificity, so if the specificity is high, one minus the specificity will be low. Now, an ROC curve is done on normalized values. So instead of being zero to 100%, it's zero to one. So low on the x-axis and high on the y-axis means sort of a, a good test, let's say. And if I really separate them out as much as I can, you see it's almost like a straight line up and then it curves around. Now I can adjust my threshold. So if I lower or if I increase my threshold, okay, my sensitivity changes, but my specificity, one minus specificity has to really change. If, or if I increase my threshold, sorry. If I lower my threshold, I get a very good sensitivity. But the flip side of that is I now have a test that is not as specific. So the trade-off point is basically up at the top left-hand corner. Does that make sense with the, depending on what you want the test to tell you, Philip? Because ultimately you're trying to, you're trying to balance these two opposing tensions to try and get the overall best quality out of the test and the best, both the best analytical quality and the best diagnostic usefulness from the test. Uh, the link to this is up on the web courses module and it's actually quite a useful one 
Um, it does all the stats and stuff like that as well, but um, it's more of these interactive demonstrations that are kind of useful just to play with and get a feel for how they're changing things. The specificity, Lizzie, can be in the kit, yeah, but as I mentioned this idea before that when you're taking the the details from the manufacturers, really because of the way the sensitivity is calculated, or the specificity is calculated based on the true negatives and false positives, it tends to be lower based on the manufacturers because they tend to have used a fairly homogeneous population who will have a low likelihood of being positive as, in a, as false positives. Whereas if you take a sort of a free living wild patient population, you have a more, a greater likelihood that the false positives there will be variable. You'll have some false positives due to people who just happen to be preclinical or people who have a lot more variability than the set that the that the individual individuals that were used in the development of the kit insert had. So I suppose long way to say it is what I've just done. Short way of saying it is that their let's say healthy population may be too healthy compared to the general population. And when they're too healthy, you will get a really good specificity, which obviously suits the manufacturers. But realistically, you should be testing for the population that is going to be under study. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm seeing an okay, so I'm taking that as good. Right, guys, um, I'm going to wish you all a happy Christmas in case I don't touch base with you all again. Um, we're not going to have anything next week, okay, because I know um, many of you are going to be studying, and I will be releasing the research ethics thing um, shortly. I'm just finalizing that, and I have... Uh, this thing for the master's second year one that I'm finalizing as well. Do you mean the data analysis exam, Lynn, or assessment in connection with this module? Do you mean the hematology and red cell? Yeah, the past papers are up. Do people know where to find past papers?